Hey everyone, this is Nick and today we're going to start a new video series exploring each desktop environment and see if we can call them user-friendly. So we're going to start with GNOME, which is probably the most interesting one to study because it's the one that has the most unconventional layout and way of doing things. So let's see if GNOME is user-friendly right after this word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safing. They are an open source company that develops the Portmaster, an all-in-one network monitoring solution. It allows you to watch everything that comes in or out of your network and then block or allow the stuff you want to take action on globally or on a per app basis. Portmaster is free as in free beer and completely open source. And it also has advanced features like filter lists to automatically block ads, trackers or malware, and it can enforce secure DNS over TLS for your whole computer. All these features are easy to access thanks to a simple and legible user interface and you can download it as a deb or an arch package. It's also available on Windows if you need it there as well. Safing Sportmaster is still in alpha and looking for users and input. The team is super responsive and you can contact them by mail, on Reddit or directly on GitHub. Follow the link in the description to download Sportmaster and give the team your thoughts. Okay, so let's just begin with a few explanations first. User-friendly can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, so here is how we are going to proceed. First, we'll take a look at the desktop as is, as if we're in the shoes of somebody that has virtually never used a computer before, that has very, very little experience with any other system. And second, since no desktop or OS exists in the vacuum, we're going to take a look at how GNOME might work for a person that is experienced with Windows or a person that is experienced with Mac. And here, of course, we're going to look at vanilla GNOME. You can make GNOME look and feel more like Windows or more like Mac OS, and some distros do. But what's interesting here is the default desktop layout. So we're going to use it on Fedora to be as close as vanilla as possible. Okay, so let's put ourselves in the shoes of a user that gets handed their first computer running GNOME. What a lucky bastard! My first computer was Windows 95. Okay, so the first experience would be with a desktop tour. This is a really cool touch that GNOME brings and that other desktops don't, KDE for example. This tour tries to explain the base concepts of the desktop, but kind of fails in my opinion. It tells people to press activities to see open windows and apps, but doesn't point out where that button is. It then tells people to arrange the app grid, but doesn't tell where the app grid is or what it is. And then it mentions workspaces without pretty explaining what they do. It also tries to get users to discover gestures, which is cool, but these aren't contextualized. If I don't have a multi-touch device that lets me use these gestures, there is no reason to tell me about it. So all in all, I think the desktop tour is a good idea, but not super well executed. It should have small animations showing where to click for the activities view, how the workspace move, where the app grid is, how you launch applications. Just having a Virtual drawing doesn't explain things enough. Oh, and it also tells user to have a look at the help app, but it doesn't have a link to the help app, so you don't really know where it is or how to access it. Now, on the desktop itself, for someone who never used a computer before, GNOME is really simple. The only thing you'll see out of the box is the top bar, so you can't really get lost. There are only three elements you can click. The clock, and it's pretty easy to figure out what that does, some smaller icons on the right, including the Power Universal logo, so there again, it's easy to figure out, and the Activities text. A beginner won't have to look for ages before they click on Activities and find out what it does. You then see your wallpaper shrink and a few application icons pop up. The search bar on top states very clearly what it does, and the bottom placed app grid icon is pretty reminiscent of a grid of apps that someone might have seen on the smartphone. All in all, it's pretty easy to understand where to go but it will require that the user be willing to click on things to try and see what they do. People who have never used a smartphone in their lives probably will have a few problems understanding these concepts. But then again, the market of people willing to try out GNOME and who never owned a smartphone is probably non-existent. Now, in terms of application style, GNOME couldn't be more simple. Even someone who never used a computer before will be able to understand what things do. Take the file manager, for example. Everything here is self-explanatory. The arrow buttons, the drop-down for the various locations, the sidebar, the search icon, or the hamburger menu. They are all concepts that are familiar to anyone that has used a smartphone in their life, or they just state plainly what they do. 
Now you don't get overwhelming menu bars, sidebars, panels and buttons and toolbars. It's all very simple. You, you really know where to click to do things. Now the GNOME header bar style is, in my opinion, an excellent way to make sure that your app is simple and easy to understand. By designing their app under the constraint of a single line of icons and buttons, the developers are forced to think about what each element is, how important it is, and how the user will perceive its role. This means, in my opinion, again, that GNOME apps are excellent for anyone that isn't used to computers at all. It's all just very simple, and by clicking on something, you figure out immediately what happens. Now then again, if the developer doesn't pay attention to that at all and lumps everything in the header bar, it's a recipe for a UX disaster. Now, the concept of store will also be very familiar to virtually everybody who ever used a smartphone in their lives. If you've never used a computer, but you have a smartphone, that's basically what you're going to be looking for to add more applications. Here, GNOME software does its job very nicely as well. The three-tab layout with Explore, Installed and Updates explains very clearly what you can do. A few recommended apps might not be what you're looking for specifically, but it focuses the user on the fact that, yes, this thing lets them find applications. It's all rooted in familiarity. Now, the search button probably should have been made more prominent. A user who wants to install something is going to have a good idea of what they're looking for, if not in name, at least in function and that necessarily goes through a search. Search is also a bit too basic. If you don't know any of the offered applications, you might want to sort by rating or last update date. But this is not possible here, so you will have to hunt for the right application yourself. So all in all, for a complete beginner that doesn't have much experience with computers at all, GNOME is very user-friendly and simple to figure out. You can't really get lost, you can't really misclick on anything, and it kind of explains everything simply just visually. Some things could be improved, like the search experience in the store and the visual tour that really doesn't teach you anything. But generally, it's a very user-friendly experience for somebody who has no prior experience. Now, for someone who is used to Windows, GNOME is a lot more confusing. The conventions you're used to just don't apply here. You don't get a taskbar or a menu. All the desktop components are located on the top of the screen, not on the bottom. Figuring out where to go to launch an application will be a very different process from what you're used to. Once you manage to find the app grid and to open apps, you also don't get a taskbar with a list of running apps. So you'll probably try to use Alt and Tab, which works here as well. But managing your windows and starting applications will probably be a learning process. If you're used to the keyboard and to press Super and then type something, then you'll be able to retain that workflow on GNOME and it will be easier. Now it's kind of a paradox here. GNOME is so different in terms of layout from Windows that experienced Windows users that are used to the keyboard will have an easier time than people who just use the mouse to navigate Windows. The applications will also probably feel weird to use. No title bar, no menu bar. While the default Windows apps starting from Windows 10 have moved on from the menu bar, a lot of third-party apps still use them. But that's not the case on GNOME. People used to the more recent style of apps from Windows 10 or for the future Windows 11 will probably find it a bit easier than people who stuck to Windows 7 or XP, since these newer apps tend to use hamburger menus, which also exist on GNOME. Interacting with your Windows is also going to be trickier. No maximize button, no minimize button. While a complete computer beginner might not have an issue with that, someone used to Windows will probably be lost here. To maximize, they will have to figure out that they need to drag the window up to the top which is also a thing on Windows, or double-click an empty space in the header bar. Now, these are familiar methods for people who are a bit experienced with Windows. But for people who are used to do everything with their mouse, they probably think that you cannot maximize at all. Now, minimization doesn't exist at all in vanilla GNOME, and I'm pretty sure people who are used to Windows will find that extremely disconcerting. Hell, even people used to Linux for a long time still complain about the lack of minimize button. And also I lied to you, you can minimize on GNOME, you just have to right click on the header bar and select minimize, which is definitely not an easy way to do it. Now the software installation method will be familiar to people used to Windows 10 or using the Windows 11 beta. You get an app store, you click install and everything works. You also get your updates here, nothing too complex. People hunting for executables online, as long as they know what they are looking for in terms of packaging format, will be fine as well. GNOME will automatically open the packages in the software app and allow users to install them. Of course, installing packages manually like this isn't generally recommended and will probably result in dependency hell. 
but that's not a GNOME specific issue. So, for a Windows user, GNOME is in a weird place. An experienced Windows user will use keyboard shortcuts and these work on GNOME as well and do generally the same thing, so they might have an easier time. But for a user using the mouse, GNOME is going to be a nightmare to navigate. No taskbar, no menu, no maximize, no minimize button. None of the concepts that you're used to navigate with a mouse exist on GNOME. Which is why I think that GNOME for a Windows user isn't really user-friendly at all. For someone moving from macOS to GNOME, the concepts here are going to feel a lot more familiar. Like, I see a lot of comments telling me that GNOME 40 basically copied macOS, and that's a real stretch. But there are some very similar things in there. So Mac user will quickly understand that the activities view is basically like the spaces view and expose on macOS. They will figure out the dock quickly because that's what they know, but the fact that the dock isn't visible outside of the activities view might confuse them quite a bit. I would expect a Mac user to try and slide their mouse against the bottom of the desktop to try and reveal a dock that will never pop up. Some say that somewhere a user is still bumping their mouse cursor helplessly against the bottom of the screen in GNOME, awaiting for a deliverance that will never come. The top bar with the time, indicators and activities button will also be pretty familiar to a Mac user. Even though the components aren't really in the same place, they fulfill the same role. The lack of a global menu bar or of a menu bar at all will probably be jarring at first, especially since you still get the name of the app that's currently running displayed on the top bar next to the activities and clicking it displays a menu. So a Mac user will probably expect to have the whole application's menu here, but that's not going to happen. The app grid will be very reminiscent of the full screen app launcher on macOS, complete with the ability to move things around and create folders. They won't be able to uninstall apps directly from there though, which might be confusing. Using the apps themselves will be a familiar experience. No in-window menu bar and header bars are concepts that macOS uses more and more over time. Safari, the Finder, the Mail app, they all gravitate towards a header bar-like solution, so there won't be much trouble here. The lack of maximize and minimize buttons will probably confuse a Mac user though, and the position of the close button won't be familiar either. On Mac, double-clicking on the header bar makes the window occupy the right size to fit the content. On GNOME, it will maximize it. macOS doesn't have the slide windows to a screen edge to maximize features, so Mac users probably wouldn't think of doing that either. Now, it's not the user's fault if macOS's window management is atrocious. Like, seriously, it's really, really bad. Now, in terms of installing apps, GNOME software won't be too alien to people who use the Mac App Store. But for those who hunt for apps online, the install process will be vastly different. On Mac, you download a DMG disk image file. You open it and drag the app to your application's folder. On Linux, the only thing that's even remotely close is app images, and you don't find them for every single piece of software on Linux. Still, double-clicking on a package will be a normal thing to do or to think of, and then GNOME will open the software app, so that shouldn't be too problematic. So GNOME is definitely going to be easier to grasp for a Mac user than for a Windows user. The activities view, the app grid, the dock, the header bars, these are all concepts that work and exist on macOS as well. So I think, yes, we can call GNOME user-friendly for Mac switchers. So, in the end, is GNOME user-friendly? For a complete beginner that has virtually no prior experience with another OS? Yes, it's super simple, super streamlined, very easy to get to grips with. Some things could be improved, of course, but basically it's a dream come true for somebody who has no experience with computers. For Mac users, most of the concepts are familiar. They will lament the lack of a dock at the bottom of screen. Window management is really different, but it shouldn't be too difficult to overcome. For Windows users though, GNOME is really on a weird position. More experienced Windows users will be able to replicate a few things with keyboard shortcuts, but the experience is just vastly alien to them. And people just used to a mouse on Windows will basically find GNOME completely unusable because, well, you can't do most things that you expect to be able to. So this video was made possible by Slimbook. If you don't know about them, they are based in Valencia, Spain, and they make Linux desktops, laptops, all-in-ones, Nux, whatever you want. For all price points, they ship worldwide, they have all keyboard layouts, all performance positions possible. Basically, you will find something they make and that you enjoy. I only use their stuff nowadays, I can only recommend them. So I left a link in the description below if you need a new Linux running device, head over there. So thank you guys for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like and subscribe. 
And if you didn't, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. I'm also on Odyssey, you can find all my videos there. And if you want to support the channel, you can also join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members. And you'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!